It was a wonderful thing, and the prediction was that it would perhaps be hundreds of years before the rest, the western part of the country, all this a massive amount of land that had been purchased, it would be hundreds of years before people would settle out there. And yet within a hundred years, uh, much of the West was, was highly settled, and, it, and, and ironically in some cases, parts of the West were more heavily settled a hundred years ago than they are today. It brought people to the land, it privatized the land. I think you can make some cases that homesteading was enormously successful and important for the development of certain areas. If you step back further and you look at a broader purpose for the Homestead Act, and that was to privatize the federal land, to create settlement, at least in terms of Western culture at that time, homesteading, I think, did achieve what it was supposed to achieve. And then interestingly, one of the greatest publicizers for homestead lands were the railroads because the railroads had received grants starting in the 1860s to build uh, infrastructure, railroads to connect to the West Coast and it was another way that the nation um, saw that it was a necessary thing to develop and the, the railroads were paid off for their efforts by an enormous amount of land that was conveyed by the federal government. Well, the railroads had this land, they wanted to get some benefit for it, so they wanted to sell the land. So they started advertising um, the great value of Western land, sometimes a little hyperbole, sometimes their brochures and all would show the great waterfalls of Kansas and other things that were a little bit improbable to try to lure people out to the West to homestead. There's so many different variations in this. Homestead legislation was not only gender blind, it was also um, minority blind in a sense. There were Hispanics who homesteaded in the American Southwest. There were other minorities that did. African Americans came and homesteaded in the West. Also, women could file for homesteads on their own. And we're talking before uh, women could vote by looking at the indexes for homestead records, you can get a sense of nationality. But in terms of, of direct statistics, it's very hard. Even for women homesteaders, uh, it's a little easier, but there's a few instances of where you can't get a very good sense even from a name. Most of the time you can, and it's estimated about 10 to 12 percent of all homesteaders were women, and that's probably based on recognition of names, Sarah's and Hannah's and, and that sort of a thing. You look at the history of um, uh, voting rights for women and that was a long drawn out affair and yet here was legislation that allowed women an opportunity when it was rather unconventional at that time and in that period of American culture for women to be that independent and it was seen as a way in the early 1900s for women to obtain some property and some income and create their own independent lives. Perhaps it was to go back and gain further education to become a teacher or, or a professional at that time. So it was quite remarkable and different.